This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and welcome to The 1000 Authors Show. My name is Vicky Quinn Fraser, and this week I've got something a little bit different for you because it's the week after the Weird and Wonderful Author Showcase. So, without um, much ado, <laughs> a little bit of ado, um, I would like to present ha- the first half of the Weird and Wonderful Author Showcase for your delight and delectation. And this week we are featuring Jocelyn Brady, Brain Coach, Sarah Maguire, Sassy Will Writer, and Kenda MacDonald, Brain Hacking Ninja. And they are all reading an excerpt from their manuscripts, which are works in progress. I'm very, very excited about them. And I'm just going to leave you now to listen to my introduction to the Weird and Wonderful Author Showcase, which will give you an idea of why I started the Weird and Wonderful Book Society and why I do what I do. And then I will be introducing each of the authors and you can enjoy their wonderful writing. We are all really excited. We're all so excited about these books. I'm so excited I can barely sit still and get my words out because I've seen all of the work that's going into these books and the stories coming out of them are just absolutely incredible. The writing is really delightful and I am so I'm so proud of everyone. I'm going to really try very hard not to cry. Um, so apologies if I do. I'm wearing really the worst mascara as well. Um, these books are going to be unlike anything else out there, which which is the whole point of the Weird and Wonderful Book Society. It is for misfits and weirdos in the best possible way, weirdos in the best possible way. Um, for people who don't necessarily fit into the mainstream look of life and business and entrepreneurship, you know, people who maybe are neurodivergent, people who maybe look a bit different, people who maybe are from different backgrounds or have different abilities and histories and experiences, people who have perhaps a message that goes against the grain, maybe people who are a little bit like you or a little bit unlike you, because everyone's story is crucial, right? Everybody has a story worth telling, including those stories that we don't always recognize as perhaps being big enough or exciting enough or, you know, anything enough. Um, There is a tradition, there is a long tradition, a long history in publishing of putting out a certain type of book by a certain type of author. Um, The gatekeepers have kept those gates for literally centuries. And you know what? Many of those books are absolutely magnificent, but there is a vast and deep and wide world of voices out there of people whose stories never get told and we never get to hear them. And this matters because if we only ever hear one narrative, we end up with a very narrow view of the world. I'm going to um, butcher a quote from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who said in her brilliant TED talk, it's not that stereotypes are untrue, but they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I bring together people from different areas, different backgrounds, different industries um, to tell their stories. Because if we don't see ourselves and um, representations of ourselves in books and films and TV shows, we don't realize what we can do and what we're capable of. So If you take nothing else away from this evening, um, take that away, that your story matters, whatever it is, wherever you're from, whatever you do, your story matters. And that we should all read a lot and read widely and, you know, join a book club because that will open our eyes to books that we might not otherwise pick up and read. And all of that, I hope, starts here or continues here today with these absolutely brilliant women. I really hope that you enjoy this evening. I hope that these ev- these readings inspire you to read more widely and you know maybe write your own book because your story matters and people want and need to hear it. Um, I'm going to be sharing a, a bit more information for you later on after you've heard from my authors because round two of the Weird and Wonderful Book Society group writing program starts on in February um, and I'm really excited about that. But now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Jocelyn Brady. She is a brain coach, a speaker, a brain new trainer, and Weird and Wonderful Book Society author. She was born near the Arctic tundra, raised on an active volcano, is still trying to figure out the thermostat, and is the genius creator of Tiny Tips for Your Brain, which is one of my favorite and funniest internet TV shows, and you must watch it immediately. 
Um, it's the internet's favorite way to play, uh, brain. And she shares bite-sized tips blending neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy, and the hefty dollop of comedy. Honestly, I laugh so much when I watch her shows. Um, and she does all of this to help you brain better. And she uses her own giant brain, which you can see on your screen, <laughs> um, to help business owners and entrepreneurs and other smart humans play to their brain's creative potential. So they create what they most want to do before they die. Important stuff, really, in other words. Um, Jocelyn is going to be reading an excerpt from the manuscript of her upcoming book, the working title of which makes me snort with laughter, um, also makes her laugh, which is how she makes most of her decisions. So... Jocelyn, I am going to unmute you and then I am going to attempt to pin you so that um, everyone can see you. Hello. Wow. Uh, you are invited to everything I ever attend to introduce me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, hi. Yeah. Jocelyn, I don't think I need any other laugh. That's how I prepare for anything like that is I just mumble a bunch of words that aren't actually words. Hello. Yes. So your brain is a magical asshat. I'm writing this because I think I love brains. I'm obsessed with them. You're about to hear why. And magical, why magical asshat? Because it's, they keep you alive and they help you think thoughts and create stuff and uh, not die, but also tell you stories that keep you from doing what makes you feel most alive. So with that, I'm going to read you an excerpt from my book, this is called Working to Everything's a Working Title until it's in print. Why aren't we cutting into its skull, though? It smelled like spoiled pickled egg farts. A tiny preserved baby pig cadaver sitting here on my lab table. High school, biology class. The assignment was to cut open the baby pig's abdomen and inspect the organs to see in real life what we'd been shown in anatomy textbooks. I'd always had a soft spot for animals, especially baby animals, and try not to think too much about why and how this little piggy died and what happened to its mom. And did she know? And was she scared? Or was she like sliced up and placed on a pizza? And I tried not to rabbit hole too deeply as to whether killing baby things or any things for the purpose of human understanding, let alone giving teenagers hacksaws to crack into and extract these organisms inner bits was part of how the world worked. I don't remember the explanation the teacher gave as to how these fetal pigs arrived, but it didn't really matter now. Staring at this specimen, because my brain had decided on a more present and pressing singular mission, it is absolutely imperative to cut into this pig skull and see its brain. This was not part of the assignment. I did not care. Must see brain. And also, was this teacher crazy? We're going to cut open and see all the other parts, but not the part powering all the parts? Inconceivable. So after lifting out the liver and kidneys and poking at lungs and unraveling intestines, I had adequately completed the required assignment. Side note on unraveling intestines. Have you ever seen that sicko 90s movie, The Cell, starring Jennifer Lopez and Vincent D'Onofrio? So D'Onofrio is some crazed ex-serial killer in a coma, and Lopez hops into his brain via some fancy mind-meld virtual reality technology of the future. And there's this one scene where D'Onofrio is gingerly winding intestines on a spool, doo -doo -doo, round and round, all while humming like a children's music box song. I do not recommend, but you're welcome for that garish image that shall be seared in my brain forever, and now maybe yours too, brain buddies. Back to the pig. It was time. I grabbed the tiny hacksaw, locked my goggles in place, all systems go, and in a rare act of resisting the impulse to go straight for what my brain wanted now, I paused and asked my best friend and lab partner, do you wanna make the first cut? No, dude, that's gross. Sweet, more for me. I proceeded to cut. A skull is not a very easy thing to break into. Your average adult human skull is between six and seven millimeters thick, about a quarter inch, strong as steel. A toddler's is around four millimeters, and a newborn tops out at nearly 1.5. A pig's skull is about 40% thicker than an average human, so even the little pre-born babies are a tougher nut to crack than their human equivalents. But 
a skull soaked in formaldehyde is more amenable to being split open. I wonder if D'Onofrio's character filed away this fact in his brain vault. Only he and Jennifer Lopez knows. Still, cracking open a skull is harder to do than, say, hacking open a coconut, in case you wanted to know. Anyway, it took quite some time to break through, and I had no idea or guidance on what I was doing. No one else in class shared my enthusiasm for this extracurricular activity, so I was the sole mad skull cutter. I'm not sure it would have mattered how long it took. I would have stayed there sawing with great fervor until kicked out on account of the teacher clocking out, and then I probably would have tried to take the fetal pig with me if still unsuccessful at that point. Thankfully, it didn't come to that because eventually I'd figured out how to cut around the skull and suction cup it off. Voila. Behold. My treasure. I gently scooped that little, beautiful, goopy brain into the palm of my hands and felt like a god. Here, cradled in my palms, no bigger than a small plum was one of the most powerful supercomputers known to exist. It was so tiny, delicate, fragile, so easy to squish and destroy. This is where our thoughts come from, I said softly to my lab partner, eyes still fixated on the tiny gelatinous orb. I was mesmerized. I was in love. And so begins my lifelong obsession with brains. But don't worry, I no longer use a hacksaw to peer inside. I can see a big round of applause going on there, Jocelyn. Um, thank you so much for that. I, <laughs> I, I loved every second of it. I think everybody else loved every second of it as well. You're getting 10 out of 10 for sound effects. Um, people <laughs> cracking up, title is so great. Um, Kenda says, and I 100% agree with this, put me down for the audiobook, please. The audiobook is going to be an absolute smash hit. I can already, I can already tell you that. Um, people saying that is that was brilliant. Holy shit, that was amazing. Awesome. Love it. <laughs> Brains. Uh, yeah, all sorts of fantastic comments. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for sharing that. Um, I really am so excited about the rest of the book. Um, has Joe jo loved slash hated the imagery? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, has anyone got any questions for Jocelyn now? Um, don't worry if you haven't. We're going to have a little bit of time at the end for questions as well. Um, I have many questions based based on on that, but I will I will save them for another time. But um, I do want to just ask. Um, I'm just going to put, put you on the spot a little bit. When when do we get to read this book, Jocelyn? So my goal is to have this uh, full draft written by my 40th birthday, which is June 11th, King Kamehameha Day, as everybody knows, obviously. Uh, And so to have that uh, come out, ultimately come out sometime this year, but draft by June. And you can go to yourbrainisamagicalasshat.com. I think I got it working this morning if you want to sign up for updates. That is incredible. And also, I'm going to ask you, Jocelyn, after we, um, after we, after we close, I was going to say close you down. That sounds terrible. After, after we stop this section, um, could, you, <laughs> could you pop into the chat box, um, that URL and also where people can find out more about you generally on the internet? Um, everybody, you know, chuck your social media handles into the chat boxes as well. Follow each other. I would like, I would love for everybody to follow the authors, particularly on their chosen social media platforms. But yeah, Jocelyn, if you can pop down your URLs, um, where, the, where people can find out more about the book and your social media handles, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Will do. Hello, I'm back in the room. Um, that was fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. I really, really enjoyed that. I hope that you all did as well. Um, keep the keep the chat on fire, people. So if um, if you've just arrived, it's it's um, there is there are no rules about kind of you know you can chat while 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 we're talking. Ask your questions, um, pop your comments in. If something moves you, if something makes you laugh, if something makes you feel something, pop that in the chat box because you won't be the only one. And it'll be really interesting to see what other people are thinking and feeling. So without um, more ado from me, I would like to uh, move on to the next author, uh, Kenda MacDonald, who is a brain hacker, not in that way, 
now that we've just had actual hacking of brains, um, who is a brain hacker and author, a marketer, and an all-round awesome human being. I have known Kenda for years. Um, I have helped I helped her out a little bit with her first book, which is called Hacked by a Brain. Um, Kenda McDonald isn't just any marketer. Her background in forensic psychology gives her a unique insight into how the buyer's brain works. And she has a foot in more than one continent. Originally from South Africa, Kenda sauntered over to the UK to start a fantastic company called Automation Ninjas, which helps business owners to understand their customers and the journeys they are on, which means more sales, more feel-good feels, and a better world for everyone. Kenda is the best-selling author of Hack the Buyer Brain, which is so good, by the way. It's now required reading in um, at least one UK university. And she is in the Weird and Wonderful Book Society to write her second book. She is a woman on a mission because while her first book focused on understanding how our brains work so we can improve customer experience and ultimately sell more of our stuff to the right people, her new book, and I can't applaud this enough, is all about fighting the dirty tricks that we see everywhere all the damn time. And I know you know what I mean with the ick factor of, of marketing, the, the, the pushy sales techniques, all of that kind of thing. Um, Kenda is here to fight that. So... Kenda, please tell us all about your book and then please read us the excerpt you have chosen. So uh, working title is not even a title. It doesn't exist. Uh, I have a working tagline, which is um, the art and science of cognitive bias um, and combating it for your marketing. Um, so the book is all about conscious consumerism and how consumers want to be conscious and how marketers like to manipulate us into not being conscious. And I feel like I'm a good place to do that because I am a marketer myself. Um, so it's all about the dirty things that we do in marketing and trying to get marketing thinking about cognitive bias a little bit differently um, and not manipulating the mistakes that the brain is making in judgments and the errors that it's making so we can create better marketing um, and help people make better and more conscious decisions. So that's the book. Let's, let's read the thing. A marketer walks into a conference. They're here to absorb, learn, and go back to the office with some enhanced tips and little bits of information that they can use to improve their conversion rates. While there, they're going to rub shoulders with other marketers, UX designers, CRO specialists, all there for one thing, to learn how to better get the desired action out of their consumer. Is this wrong? Absolutely not. When you need to improve what you're doing, an astute marketer turns to others to learn. We all know what it is to reach for our computers, our phones, researching a new topic, a new tool, and a new tactic. We scour the internet for clues to help us improve and become better. Like amoebas for knowledge and information, we're constantly on the hunt for our next tip or how-to to absorb and subsume. And yes, I did just liken marketers to amoebas, and I used the word hunt. And while hunting and amoebas might not be synonymous, many amoebas are actually predatory. And unlike sharks or lions who swan around for most of the day doing absolutely nothing at all, amoebas are constantly at work. Hunt, absorb, hunt, absorb, hunt and absorb. And conferences provide marketers with the perfect place to do this. It's a smorgasbord of expertise and ideas that we can use to get the conversion. We learn from others just like us, feverishly dissecting their successes, all consuming in our desire to know how to apply it to our own business, our own campaigns and our own strategy. But we don't stop there. Our ferocious appetite means we inhale blog posts at an alarming rate. We rattle through podcasts, books, and webinars. And our journey for enhancement knows no bounds. A modern marketer is a beautiful Frankenstein creature of ideas, methodologies, and tactics collated to further our main objective, getting that conversion. And this frenetic activity sees the industry constantly evolving to stay ahead of our prey, that slippery modern consumer. And this iteration of the consumer is exactly slippery. They are ever changing in their needs and wants, they in turn driving marketing innovation that allows us to keep their consumption journey on track. So we as marketers must be nimble, we must be strategic, we must be clever to catch them, a daunting process for even the best specialists. But not to worry, we learn from other marketers, we innovate and experiment, we hunt and absorb, we grow our marketing bubble full of cleverness and strategy. With all this tactical know-how under our belts, we set our battle plans to capture the conversion. We target our audience, trawling consumer hangouts to find our leads. We craft lead magnets and tripwires, anything shiny to get them to, to turn their heads towards us. We grab their attention and lure them in, hoping they'll click and hit our landing pages, carefully optimized for stickiness to catch them like flies on sticky paper. 
The lead captured, we carefully funnel them to where we need them to go, enticing and controlling, using every trick that we have to get them to the next stage. But because these are modern consumers, they often escape and work their way out of our funnels. So we react. We build weaponized bad boys bristling with triggers and attentional cues, catching any lead that falls out and bringing them back into the fold. Our campaigns morph, becoming glistening, personalized, behavioral, omni-channel behemoths. We use them to deliver delicious content, to fatten the leads and lead them carefully and sweetly. Our consumers doe-eyed and complacent towards the conversion. Are you feeling uncomfortable yet? Whilst this example is harsh and full of hard words, it's the unfortunate reality of our so-called modern marketing, an act of collusion and control. We trick and cajole consumers into completing the actions we want. Acts of engagement are done purely to enhance conversion rates. Nurture is a strategy utilized to enhance profits. Our arsenal of hacks and secrets continues to grow, and we proudly sit back and revel in our own ingenuity. The only fly in the ointment is that slippery modern consumer. Our quarry fights. Unfortunately, they don't enjoy the collusion. They don't enjoy being tricked. They don't care about your conversion rates and your carefully laid traps. They have their own agenda and it looks nothing like yours. They are far more clever than we ever gave them credit for and they are fighting back. This interplay of marketers needing to get the conversion and how we use the tools and strategies to get leads and consumers Sussing out what we have in store for them and rebelling against it is the divide. It's the rift between us and our products and the audience that we know it's a good fit for. And that gap gets bigger every day and we are the cause. The problem is not what we're doing, it's how we're doing it. If you walk into any conference, there will be talks and tips and strategies that you can use immediately to enhance your conversions. Anything rooted in psychology gets you bonus points. We love knowing how the brain works, not purely from general interest, but as a tool for our own game. We want to game the system. And if you lay it out like this, marketing seems like a nasty little group of conversion bandits, lusting purely after KPIs and carrying not one little sausage for the end consumer. I appreciate we're not all bad. My point is that modern marketing is fundamentally flawed in the way that we approach our aims. We have an endpoint in mind and we build our campaigns to coerce. Our terminology doesn't help either. We create lead capture forms. We design tripwires. We employ behavioral modification campaigns to entice clicks and engagement. Is the battle for conversion really so fierce that we need to utilize guerrilla tactics and induce virality? We forget one essential thing in all the strategies, tools, and tricks. Our consumers aren't adults. Most of them know precisely what's going on. We're not really here to help. We're here for conversion. And those that are still in the dark develop a deep sense of distrust when they do suss it out. But marketing plunders on, treating our audience like idiot consumers still living the dark ages of marketing. Consumers are readying up for battle, and you need to choose sides. We're in the era of the conscious consumer, a consumer highly knowledgeable, clear in their needs and wants, and with the internet at their disposal to help them make the best choice possible. That power is immense, and they're not only loyal to their need in the moment, um, but their cause too. Increasingly, they use their power to make decisions in a way that we aren't building for. The brain taps into deep-seated in-group and out-group functionality when assessing both people and companies. And our survival as a species is strongly linked to our social strategy of grouping together. Our ancestors shared the burden of childcare, hunting, gathering, and looking after the old. And this led to humans being strongly driven by familiar association. Birds of a feather flock together. In-group and out-group functionality is driven by two parts in the brain, the mesolimbic system and the amygdala. The amygdala is your key to survival. When we encounter people we don't like, the out-group, it generates feelings of fear and distrust. On the other hand, the mesolimbic system gives us a nice little dopamine hit when we're with the people that we like and trust, our in-group. The interplay of these two regions marshals how we respond to the people around us. Tie that in with some of the in-group and out-group cognitive biases, and you get a recipe for consumers viscerally averse to the things that don't align with them. If your goals and their goals don't match, you're in the out-group. Match their desire for purpose, leverage their values, help them attain their goal, and you're part of the in-group. They see coercive marketing for what it is, and each time they uncover it, it pushes them further away. To draw them closer, we innovate, we experiment, and we create a new way to trick them into our conversion traps. And every time we do so, they catch us out and it drives the wedge deeper, pushing us further into the outgroup.
What is key to us in exploration of topics in this book is how we become part of the in-group. To do that, we need to take a look at what has driven consumers to become conscious. Beneath all the alignment of social and environmental impact is a deeper driver, the desire for knowledge, to understand and learn more, to make better decisions, more conscious decisions. Rather than rummaging around in our toolkit of tricks, we need to lean into their desire for consciousness. That is the key, empowering the modern consumer by helping them make better decisions. To help a conscious consumer, we have to abandon collusion. Your audience has a problem. You have the solution to it. Your challenge is matching up the problem and the solution in the way that your audience understands and helps them assess whether or not you're viable and a viable outcome. It's a process of empowerment, not of manipulation. I got so excited. I lost the mute button then. Um, Kenda, that was fantastic. Thank you. I don't know about anybody else, but um, the kind of marketing that Kenda is talking about, the kind of marketing that we should be doing is the kind of marketing I want to be doing for show. So, um, and there's a load of awesome comments in here, not least of which is just the <laughs> David Attenborough. Very David Attenborough. Loved the idea of a mockumentary with Kenda naming the marketing creatures, as Jocelyn has suggested. Um there's a request for Amoeba sound effects. You can probably ignore that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, that was fantastic. Thank you, <laughs> Joseph, Joseph, angry now. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think it really brings home um, the really important point about your book, which is that there is it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> the marketing doesn't have to be this way. There is a better way, a more profitable way for everybody to do it. And so I am really, really, really excited um, about your book. Um, Kenda, thank you. Well done. That was amazing. Um, please put your uh, contact details, your social media details, your website details into the chat box. And if anyone has any questions for Kenda right now or at the end, please pop them in the chat box as well, because you'll get a chance to ask them and have them answered. Um, there's a couple of questions that was awesome yinka wants you to sign hi yinka yinka wants you to sign her copy of your book of your book um me too um mindy says really informative and presented in a fun and engaging way i saw that brian said it was great content as well um earlier on jocelyn says bestseller number two <laughs> fantastic um thank you so much kanda we will talk to you again shortly um okay Next up, introducing the fabulous, the hilarious, the sassy Sarah Maguire. Um, she is next up. Sarah Maguire is hell bent on putting the fun back into dying. And she is on a mission to help us all make the future easier for the people we love, which is really bloody important because I don't know about you, but I know that it took me far too long to get my affairs in order because I refused to accept that I was an adult and I needed to do some adulting. Um, and Sarah's mission is to help us make make our own peace of mind easier and make it easier and secure for the people that we love. She's really serious about this. She's serious about helping us sort out our wills. She's serious about helping us get our lasting powers of attorney in place. And she's equally serious about having a giggle at the same time, because life is, after all, absurd. So when Sarah first joined the Weird and Wonderful Book Society, she was not quite sure what her book would look like, which, by the way, is very normal. Um, and her initial ideas developed into the manuscript she is reading from this evening. She is a very funny lady. She has great stories to tell, and I am really excited to introduce Sarah um, Maguire. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you're writing this book. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I think you've said it all, haven't you? <laughs> There's nothing left to say. Uh, yeah, I'm a will writer. Um, and I'm trying to shake up things a little bit. It's a bit dull, isn't it? We all tiptoe around, uh, try not to uh, say the, the big D word in front of our, our clients. We don't like to talk about death, even though that's what we're in the business of talking about. So um, I'm trying to capture those people who, like myself, have been terrified of death all their lives, but kind of realise it's, it's still going to happen. Um, and, and just don't want to tiptoe around any longer. They want to have a giggle while they're getting everything in order. And also try to bring home the important things that we need to think about that we bury normally. So my working title 
is death. It's a bit shit, isn't it? Uh, whether or not that will stay, I don't know, but it's it's what I like at the moment. So I'm going to read an excerpt from that book, which the name we don't know, but there you go. Um, yeah, see what you think of it. It's a bit different. <laughs> I'm just reading the comments now. I'm not going to concentrate now. Okay, so when out jogging through the woods, I like to think I resemble one of the all-time classic long-distance runners. A cross maybe between Hailey Gaby Selassie and Paula Radcliffe. Obviously when she was breaking the world marathon record, not when she was squatting in the gutter at the Olympics having a wee. You see, in my mind's eye, I'm fleet of foot, I'm svelte and swift, like a gazelle galloping through the trees. Unfortunately, the reality is somewhat different. Today, as I lumbered, red-faced, panting and with bulging eyes, even I could admit I looked more like a rampaging rhinoceros than a graceful gazelle. However, I still enjoyed my surroundings. Beautiful colours of the woods greeted me, and the gnarled trunks interspersed with foliage, a thousand different shades of green. Flowers bursting forth, overhead, a canopy of green leaves swayed softly in the breeze, protecting me from the glare of the sunshine. I could hear birds tweeting, leaves rustling, I felt a gentle breeze, distant hum of traffic. The scent of flowers drifted into my nostrils, along with a slightly more earthy smell of horseshit as I ran along the bridle way. About a mile into my run, I saw in the distance two women and their dogs approaching. Without hesitation, I sucked in my stomach, lifted my knees, dropped my shoulders, pulled myself up to my full height, still not very high, I grant you, and greeted them with a cheery wave, just like any seasoned athlete would. Immediately, I stacked it on a tree root and fell down to the ground with a crash. As I lay there with a mouthful of blood and dirt, I convinced them that I was absolutely fine. I waved away their offers of help and I struggled up into a standing position once more, like a newborn baby giraffe struggling to its feet for the first time, arms and legs flailing. Again, I said, I'm, I'm absolutely fine, I'm fine. I jumped up quickly as I could and ran off into the distance keeping up the pretense that I was absolutely fine. Thinking by now, the dogs were probably following me, smelling the fresh blood gaping from my oozing wounds. But as soon as I got out of their, their eyesight, I stumbled, I slowed, the agony overtaking me. Ignoring the immense pain coming from my shoulder, my knee, my cheekbone, I stumbled on. I daren't stop, convinced that if I did, I'd be like one of those poor, wounded creatures who curl up and die in the middle of the forest somewhere, left alone. Somehow, I managed to hobble the remaining mile home. Convinced by now, the flesh on my cheekbone must be hanging off, my arm at the very least broken, my shoulder and knee both dislocated. Once inside, I hauled myself up the stairs to the bathroom to inspect the damage. Imagine my horror when I looked in the mirror. There appeared to be no rivers of blood, no bone protruding from wounded flesh. Instead, just a small red mark on my face, a grazed elbow and a teeny weeny mark on my knee. How could this be? Look. I don't have the answers. It is indeed one of life's great mysteries. So what have I learned from this debacle? Surely it's not just that I'm a bit of a wimp. No, there must be some deeper, more profound lesson I can draw from this. Unfortunately, I have nothing. Apart from to wonder why it's so embarrassing to fall over in front of others. Is it the loss of dignity? the humiliation, the fear of being laughed at. I have to be honest, I don't think there's many things much funnier than watching someone else fall over. 
You've been framed was made for people like me. Give me a bucket of popcorn and a half hour of watching people go arse over elbow and I'm as happy as a pig in shite. I realise it's not my most pleasant trait. Perhaps knowing how hysterical I find it to watch others fall over is why I struggle with the thought of falling over myself. But for me, it's still better to be laughed at than to be pitied, to be fussed over or helped to my feet. Because to be the object of someone's sympathy rather than someone's mocking can only mean one thing. I'm getting old. Better, surely, to have someone's first thought of seeing me fall over is that, haha, she's making a prat of herself, rather than concern that actually I've broken my hip or fractured my pelvis. After all, who wants to think about a time a simple fall could result in a loss of independence or being reliant on others? Better to laugh at mine and others' misfortunes than entertain the uncomfortable realisation that it may indicate a deeper truth, that we're covering up our own fears about ageing, about becoming frail, deteriorating and losing, and losing to the inevitable march of time. So, yeah, keep on laughing at me, please. And don't, whatever you do, offer me a helping hand up if I fall over in front of you. Sarah, that was an absolute delight. Thank you so much. Um, there's a couple of a couple of comments. Mindy said that was a really great transi- transition to the series. Hell yes, it was really skillfully done. Um, the uh, <laughs> the actions. Where did that come from? I loved it. I loved this. I mean, I, I don't know how it's going to translate in print, but I, I reckon we can try. We can try. Um, <laughs> and the scenic details, as Jocelyn said, the scenic details were chef's kiss. Beautiful. You really set the scene beautifully. You built up the tension beautifully. Um, it was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was it, this book is going to be so great. It's going to be very different. It's not going to be your usual will book. And that, I think, was the whole point, right? We wanted to we wanted to make people laugh. We wanted it to not be quite as serious. And you want to you want to change the industry. So that was the first half of the Weird and Wonderful Showcase with Jocelyn, Kenda and Sarah. And I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I did the other day. Honestly, it was beyond my wildest dreams. In the next few weeks, I will be sharing the next half, the second half of that author showcase featuring Melanie Osborne and Hilary Weiss Presswood. And I'm really excited for you to hear those because um, you'll hear what a vast variety of books there are just in, in that small number of people. And I really hope as well that listening to these authors read excerpts from their book shows you what is possible for you because not all of these authors would have called themselves writers before they sat down to write. And I think you'll probably agree that it would be impossible to pick and choose which which one of those people <laughs> thought that they were writers and which weren't. So yeah, I I just hope that their readings inspire you to think about writing your book if it's something that's been on your mind for a while and you're wondering if it's something that people will be interested in I promise you it is you have got a story that's worth telling and if you are ready to write your book start and if you would like to start now I would love for you to join us in the Weird and Wonderful Book Society doors are opening again the first call kicks off on February the 3rd which is next week so yeah if you've got any questions go along and get all of the information from moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash weird and wonderful or you can book a quick call with me if you have questions or you can email me with questions or you can drop me a voxer with questions I will happily answer anything that you would like to ask me but yeah there are as of recording this there are six places left so don't miss out Joe will be back next week Thank you so much for listening. As always, don't forget to check out those authors. Go find them on social media. All of the links to them are in the show notes. Go and follow them. You'll find out more about when their books are available and then buy their books when they're out. And on that note, I will leave you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Podfly, for making this wonderful. Thank you, Harriet, for keeping me on track. And I will be back same time next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Mm